Let's talk about mind control in RPGs in general and mind control in GURP specifically. Mind control powers come up extremely often in fiction and RPGs. D&D and GURPS wizards have access to such spells as Charm or Dominate. Priests of deities of evil or law may create cults through supernatural brainwashing. Many monsters possess powers to take over the minds of others, be they green dragons, mind flayers, aboleths, basically all the cool monsters. But the implications on the game world aren't often discussed, and using mind control on player characters is something few talk about. And there is a lot to talk about. Back in the day, I remember reading some online discussion on a D&D forum where people were saying that using mind control magic on player characters is something of a taboo. It's just not a nice thing to do, as it takes away the player's agency, and no player likes that. I remember some video games, I think that was Neverwinter Nights, treat mind control as simple daze or stun when it is used on a player character. To me, that sounds unfair. This is something like reverse GM magic. If, as a player, I am fighting a villain who is known to possess mind control powers, it will feel very off to me if he didn't use them on me. So what are the ways around it? In most RPGs, and GURPS is no exception, mind control can be soft and hard. Hard mind control means that the mind is under total control and the victim has absolutely no agency. This is how the mind control advantage works in GURPS by default. Then there is soft mind control, when the victim is given a goal that he must pursue, but he's free to choose how he's going to pursue it. This is how mind control advantage with a suggestion limitation works. So the victim still has some agency at least, and doesn't become an NPC if he was a player character. However, in GURPS the mind control advantage has the following clause. If you attempt to force the subject to act against his principles, for example, commit suicide or harm the loved one, roll another quick contest. If your victim wins, he breaks free. In addition to that, if the caster loses, he cannot try to control that particular victim again for 24 hours, but this immunity can be changed or removed with certain enhancements. These two aspects do a wonderful job reining mind control in. It remains a very powerful tool, but it cannot reliably, for example, force one party member to kill another one. If the victim of mind control gets a command like that, or something along the lines of Your life is nothing. You serve zero purpose. You should kill yourself now. Then there's a big chance that he'll get to resist again. What I like the most here is that it's not restricted exclusively to self-destructive behavior, but also to the character simply acting against his principles. For example, in D&D it might be unclear what those principles are, but in GURPS your character has a defined set of disadvantages. Sense of duty to adventuring companions is excellent at preventing party members from killing one another. If you try to compel a dwarf with miserliness to give you all his gold, he'll likely punch you in the face instead. If you compel somebody with truthfulness to lie, he gets a chance to break the effect. To use mind control effectively, your orders still have to somewhat correspond with the personality of the victim, otherwise it won't last long. In one of my games, two adventurers were exploring a dungeon taken over by mind flayers, and one of the mind flayers managed to use mind control to force one of the adventurers to attack another, that was soft mind control, so he still had some agency in how he approached attacking his friend, and it didn't last long, so I think that violated the player's agency no more than a paralysis spell would. Sure, there was like two or three attacks that he managed to make, but he snapped out of it and killed the mind flayer instead. In my opinion, I believe that the mind control college in GURPS is the most powerful and versatile one, but I still do not believe it to be overpowered. I really like how GURPS treats mind control, however, I think that for example in sorcery it needs some adjustments. While the mind control spells from GURPS magic can only work on sapient beings, mind control in sorcery doesn't have that restriction, so it also works on animals and mindless beings. I like to reintroduce this restriction by applying accessibility only on sapient beings to all mind control abilities. This way the niche of druids controlling animals is protected. 
But what about the social implications of mind control or even mind reading? GURPS does have something about that, but I found a book that talks about that in more detail. Enchantment – Fire in the Mind – part of the Encyclopedia Arcane series by Mongoose Publishing, a third-party supplement for D&D 3.0. It talks about an interesting paradox. Mind control abilities give you many ways to make friends, but nobody wants to be around a mind controller or even a mind reader. Just imagine interacting with somebody who can read or control your mind. Would you trust him? Wouldn't you doubt your actions? Did you just sell something for a good price because you're friends with this person? Or did he force you to do that? Personally, I think this is a horrifying prospect. How do you represent that in GURPS? GURPS size or PSYS, I'm still not sure, talks about this. It introduces the following disadvantage. Social stigma telepath. You receive minus one to reactions from normal folk. The reaction penalty becomes minus two from anyone who has a reason to believe that you may use your telepathy on him. It also has code of honor psychics. Never use your psionics purely for personal gain. Never harm another person with your psionics except in self-defense. And never psychically invade somebody else's privacy, including eavesdropping without his knowledge. But uh, while it talks about psionics, it can be applied to magic mind control, divine mind control, and anything else. GURPS Fantasy suggests introducing legality classes to spells and magical abilities. The example division provided in the book lists mind control spells as MLC2 and large-scale mind control spells as MLC1. Thus, if you are using this framework, Mind control spells should only be available to you if you are part of law enforcement, intelligence or similar social class, which seems sensible enough. This may require you to take the aforementioned code of honor and other disadvantages, but probably wouldn't exempt you from social stigma. In addition, this may coexist with social regard, feared. Overall, nobody still will like you very much. But what if your powers are innate? They are illegal, but you cannot unlearn them. You might need to get the secret disadvantage instead, with its severity depending on the local culture and laws. And in a society where magic is known, there are likely going to be laws for violating somebody's mind without consent. However, there should be also ways to prove that this act has transpired, otherwise the law wouldn't make much sense. Fortunately, we have such things as detect magic, reconstruct spell, and similar abilities for um, other power sources. So there you go. I hope I gave you some food for thought and made you think about the world building and gameplay implications of mind control abilities. So thank you for watching, and I will see you next time.